Good evening and welcome to my channel. Uh, it's been a while since I've um, read a story but um, I have been very busy. Uh, just to warn you there may be quite a lot of extraneous noise as there's people out and about in the sunshine um, socializing on terraces and having fun all that sort of irritating stuff. So um, if you hear any noise in the background um, that's probably what it is. And also I'm going to do a shameless plug because uh, my book, Running the Orient, is um, out on the 14th of August, available from all good bookstores. Um, there's a launch event on the 13th, which I'll include a link to a Facebook event that you can, um, where you can join the, the event. Um, it'll, it'll be at 7 p.m. on the 13th, and um, there will also be the possibility of getting a signed copy, should you wish one. Um, but you'll have to um, log on to that event for that. Anyway, running the Orient, story of my crazy 2,300 mile run across Europe is um, now out. Anyway, plug aside, <laughs> I have written a short story, um, as usual, a thousand words long and based on five random words, which I just realised, oh no, I've got them written down here, what am I talking about? Anyway, it doesn't matter because I'm going to display them on screen, and they are... Okay, and this story is called Inheritance. It's my own stupid fault, I realised, limping across the field in torrential rain, aiming for the ramshackle barn at the edge of the forest. I'd been learning to ride for exactly ten days, but in my usual impetuous slash stupid manner, delete as appropriate, I decided to take Jacobus, our chestnut stallion, out into an incipient storm, alone. Kate, my wife, urged me not to, but proud of my recent acquisition of both horsemanship and property, I wanted to practice being Lord of the Manor and survey the grounds. At least take your phone, Kate called from the dining room as she polished the thickly patterned porcelain in my granddad's antique display cases. Shit, this place is a mausoleum, she'd muttered when she'd first seen the dilapidated mansion. It had taken some persuading to bring her out to deepest Hampshire from North London, but I'd worked hard to gain the affections of the old man, and I'd be damned if I wasn't going to enjoy owning an admittedly decrepit stately home, for at least as long as the daydream lasted. Childless, mid-forties, with little prospect of procreating, couldn't we live out an idyll in the country instead of mimicking the bourgeois city lifestyles of our en famille friends? Did I take my phone? Of course not. I'd wanted to have an undisturbed, transcendent experience, with the magnificent animals barely controlled velocity driving me, and the gathering storm's dark energy as backdrop. I wanted to focus my mind. I didn't want any of the distractions of modernity. That's why I battled back into the affections of the horrible old tyrant, after all, to seize the grand prize of tranquility and luxurious isolation. Perhaps I'd actually write that long-awaited great British novel now. Perhaps Kate would grow to love me again. Inevitably, I hadn't a clue what to do when the deer leapt from the hedgerow as we galloped the unkempt meadow, livid red berries and rain-spattered foliage whipping past. Jacobus bucked in shock and I slipped out of the stirrups, lost my grip on the reins and tumbled off my horse onto the long grass. That the estate had not been effectively managed for decades probably saved my life, since, needless to say, I had not worn my riding helmet. Carefree and careless go hand in hand, oftentimes. Landing on my shoulders and rolling onto one side, a vicious stab of pain shot up my right ankle. I twisted it in the stirrup as I'd been thrown. Jacobus was now bolting across the ten-acre field towards the hill on the far side with impressive speed. Already out of earshot, even if he had any inclination to heed my pitiful cries, which he evidently did not. Fucking hell, I exclaimed to the void. Shouting at the slate grey sky as it poured down miserably diagonal rain seemed to help, and I continued a volley of incohate abuse as I tested out the ankle and found it wanting. I dragged myself into the limited shelter of the hedgerow and spotted a stout branch, possibly discarded by a hiker deep in the mist of rural time. I slotted it under my right armpit like a crutch, and made it to my feet with a minor thrill of triumph. It didn't last. I was now a mile and a half from the house, and the weather was brutal. 
I found the wind buffeting me and the icy rain stinging one side of my face into numbness within minutes. Then I saw the old barn, across the narrow strip of land to where two fields intersected. It was partly hidden by tall oaks and beeches, which bode well for it providing shelter, but less well whenever forks of pale purple lightning illuminated the tree line. Hell, I'd take my chances with the electricity. This rain was intolerable. Less than five minutes later, I stumbled into the musky, musty interior of the barn and collapsed onto some decrepit hay bales. Mice squeaked and scurried. Somewhere a plank banged incessantly, and the thunder roared a basso profundo against which cymbal clashes of lightning played. The drips in the cobweb-strewn interior of the barn were many and frequent, but there were corners where no rain penetrated, and I nestled into one to wait out the storm. What an idiot I'd been, I realised, able to admit it away from the told-you-so smugness of strangers. When my father had collapsed with his third and final heart attack, I realised that either myself or my cousin Bradley would inherit Capworth Hall, its grounds and gardens. At the funeral I watched glumly as Bradley helped the ailing nonagenarian out of his wheelchair and into the church pew. Although twelve years younger, Bradley had a head start since he lived only fifteen miles from Capworth and had visited his grandfather regularly. I'd seen Capworth Senior exactly twice since I left Hampshire for university. However, Bradley was gay, with no plans to adopt or father a child through surrogacy, and I knew I could play upon our grandfather's prejudices. A word or two in the old bastard's ear during the wake, and the deal was done. He died less than a year later, his will reformulated to make Kate and I sole beneficiaries of his estate. Some good that would do me, if I perish from pneumonia or exposure here in this derelict shack. I heard the rain lessening after a while, and was about to lever myself to my feet when I spotted some graffiti carved into one of the barn's uprights. You can't take it with you. Someone had painstakingly scratched out this warning here. Why? Was it intended to be ironic or baldly pragmatic? It didn't matter. As I limped back out into the darkening meadow, I now knew two things with absolute certainty. Our country idyll had already gone haywire and could only, only end in tragedy. The portents foretold it, for Christ's sake. Secondly, and more encouragingly, I now had the perfect title for my book. The End so, um, One of the first stories I've tried to write in the first person, and from the perspective of a not very likeable person, so um, it'll be interesting to see what you think. Uh, feel free to comment, um, share, watch another one, subscribe to the channel. Um, and I will see you again very soon. Bye.